Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, just wanted to give a brief uh, introduction into uh, who I am. Uh, my name is uh, Ryan Kamenik, uh, and I'm here to present on Islam, uh, just a brief introduction uh, this evening. Um, and this is part of our uh, monthly uh, talk where we uh, feature uh, different faiths within our, uh, uh, within our interfaith community of Simi Valley and, and the community at large. Um, so this month uh, we're presenting on Islam, uh, uh, which I'll be presenting. And then next month we have on March 25th, I believe is the date. Um, so mark your calendars. Uh, we have a gentleman uh, from the Shumash uh, Native American uh, um, uh, community uh, presenting about uh, their religious beliefs. So that will be a really, really fascinating topic. So please uh, come by again next month. Uh, again, that's March 25th, same time. Uh, for that talk. It'll be really, really fascinating. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, again, my name is uh, Ryan Kampanik. I'm with the Islamic Society of Simi Valley, Islamic Center of Conejo Valley. Uh, I um, was born um, into a Christian family and uh, reverted to Islam uh, probably about 12 years ago. Um, so I've been in California since 1999. Um, moved out here. I grew up in a military family, moved around a lot, uh, had a lot of different experiences. Um, and uh, then I went to a university out here, graduated from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, the Central Coast, go Mustangs. Um, graduated in 2006 with a bachelor's degree in uh, microbiology. Um, and then I got my master's degree from the University of Phoenix um, back in 2013. Um, in business. Um, so obviously with all those credentials, I'm obviously very uh, knowledgeable on Islam. No, just kidding. That has nothing to do with Islam <laughs> whatsoever. Um, so, uh, but uh, fortunate I've been, um, uh, I learned um, more about Islam as time has gone on. And so since I've had experience, you know, growing up in, you know, in a different re religion, I thought it would be just a good way for to segue into um, this topic, present it um, in a way that maybe I, I can draw upon my past experiences so that we can all understand our faiths a little bit better from a different perspective, as opposed to someone who just grew up only in an Islamic family or was Muslim their whole lives. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Okay. Some facts about Islam. So actually only uh, around 20% of Muslims are actually Arabs. It's the second largest religion in the world with 1.8 billion uh, people that are a part of the uh, religion. Uh, and that includes around three and a half million Americans such as myself. Uh, Muslims are not allowed to gamble, drink alcohol or, or eat pork. Um, so it's actually very similar on the pork uh, as our uh, um, Jewish brothers and sisters. Our holy day is Friday, um, and we uh, worship at a mosque, and our holy cities are Mecca, Medina, and uh, Jer Jerusalem as well. Uh, you'll see the actual uh, Muslim population distribution. Uh, if you look, uh, most people, you know, think of, you know, this area of the world, uh, you know, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia and, and the Middle East as, you know, the place where Muslims live. And as I said before, 20% of the world's Muslim population is non-Arab. So that 20% is spread out uh, over into part of the Indian subcontinent. Um, you have uh, a lot of our, our uh, North and uh, North Central uh, Africa in East Africa and then a very large population in Southeast Asia. So uh, the, there's a misnomer in the, uh, the, uh, uh, in the world that believes that a lot of Muslims are just Arabic speakers you know, from Saudi Arabia. And that's actually not true. That's actually the minority of Muslims. Here's an example of a, uh, of a Muslim mosque in Calgary. Uh, I just wanted to show off uh, you know, uh, a lot of the Muslim structures have a lot of that dome feature. You see that dome feature in a lot of different architecture as well. Um, you'll see this in, in Europe. Uh, some of the churches have domes. You even see this in the Capitol building. So it's a lot of that's uh, uh, inspired by Islamic architecture. And uh, there are some quite famous uh, Muslims out there. 
Uh, we have Cat Stevens, the uh, the singer, uh, Muhammad Ali, uh, sports figures such as Muhammad Ali, Shaquille O'Neal, um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, um, and then uh, most recently in uh, in the last Olympic Games, uh, we had a bronze medalist, uh, Ibtah uh, Ibta Hajj uh, Mohammed, um, who uh, is a Muslim American, uh, and she uh, got the bronze medal in fencing. Uh, we also have activists such as Malala, uh, who uh, works for, uh, uh, or she uh, fights for uh, human rights throughout the world, um, and then uh, the icon Malcolm X. So quite a different, uh, Muslims don't, they're just not one shade of color, one type of people, they're not a race, it's a religion. So that's why I wanted to show with this uh, uh, slide deck. Islam, a brief background, uh, Christian Jews and Muslims all trace their lineage through Abraham, peace be upon him, uh, since the Abrahamic religions. And you'll hear me say a lot of peace be upon him after uh, the prophets um, of Islam, uh, it's, a, it's a sign of respect. So um, that's what we do uh, when, we, when we talk about Muhammad, peace be upon him, Jesus, peace be upon him, and, and Abraham, peace be upon him. Uh, Jews, Christians, and Muslims share many of the same stories and beliefs, although they may be slightly different. That's Adam and Eve, Abraham, Noah, Moses, peace be upon them all. Uh, we all have the, uh, the same lineage of, of prophets and many of the same stories. Uh, Muslims, we follow a lunar calendar, which is 12 months, which is 29 or 30 days. Um, and so each of our uh, Islamic years are about uh, 10 or 11 uh, days shorter um, than the, the Gregorian calendar. So our major holidays of Eid al-Fitr, which is the end of Ramadan, and Eid al-Adha, which is the end of Hajj and, uh, and is the sacrifice, uh, those occur um, uh, within, I would say, uh, like two and a half months of each other, but our holidays will all move up in the Gregorian calendar. And that's what actually makes Islam quite beautiful. And with Ramadan, we, we do a lot of, you know, we do the fasting from, um, from dawn till sunset. And so during the summer months, it can be quite long and quite, quite challenging. Um, but being a Muslim, it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, uh, it doesn't matter any of that stuff, north, south, where you are on the planet, you will experience Ramadan uh, if we're fortunate enough to live long enough because it takes about 33 years. So um, if you live into adulthood, uh, you should uh, experience this twice, uh, two times over. Um, you'll experience Ramadan in the summer, the fall, the winter, the spring. Um, and so it's equal for everyone. So it doesn't matter where you live. Okay, some other facts uh, as well is that, what, what does Islam mean? Well, Islam means to submit to God. And Islam is also derived from the Arabic word salam, which literally means peace. So when, uh, when uh, Muslims greet each other, we say salam alaikum, which means peace be upon you. And the greeting back uh, is walikum salam is peace be upon you as well. So uh, salam is really, really important, means peace. Uh, uh, and that peace is a physical peace and a spiritual peace. The term Muslim means one who submits. As I said before, uh, uh, Islam is a, a monotheistic uh, religion coming from the Abrahamic uh, traditions. Um, God uh, means, uh, or Allah means God, and it means one God or the God. So Allah does not have any other meaning. So in English, we have God, and that could be the big G, or we have the little g, God or goddesses. So we don't have anything comparable in Islam. Yeah, it's just, Allah is, is the God. There is no other deviation from that in terms of uh, the wording of Allah. It's also important to note that this is the same God that we're talking about from the Abrahamic religions, uh, from, uh, from the creator of, of the heavens and the earth. Uh, Allah is not just a separate God. It doesn't mean separate God that we're worshiping other than uh, uh, the Jews or the Christians or, or the Baha'is or any other faith. It's just the Arabic word for God. So Arabic Christians uh, that, that live in a predominantly Arabic speaking world will, will say Allah for God. Um, 
if you actually look back at Aramaic, uh, uh, Jesus's language, uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, uh, his word for uh, God was Allah. So that is, I just wanted to make that a point that it's, it's not a separate God than the, than the one and only God from the monotheistic Abrahamic uh, religions. So as I stated before, Muslims believe in Adam, Abraham, uh, Noah, Moses, and Jesus, uh, peace be upon them all. And we believe that they practice Islam and we're all prophets, all, uh, all with the same message uh, to worship the one God. We do not view uh, Jesus as the son of God, uh, peace be upon him. So just as Adam, peace be upon him, had no earthly father, neither did Jesus. We regard the Hebrew structures in the gospel as divine revelations. However, they have been changed over time or have been lost altogether. And this, the, the changing doesn't necessarily mean to, that, that it was nefarious changes, uh, which, which could happen, of course. But these are because of translation issues. Uh, we don't have the original gospel. Um, we have, you know, the gospels, Peter, Park, uh, Mark, uh, Luke, and John, and everything like that. But it's, it's, it's the word of man about, you know, about Jesus's time. We don't actually have the physical gospel in the original language of Aramaic. Um, and so we don't have the actual, the actual translate or the actual original books uh, from that date going forward. Uh, and we believe that only, uh, only God, not any angel, not any prophet, not any priest, not any man may forgive uh, uh, our sins. So that's important. So when we pray, uh, when you see Muslims praying, a lot of times we're, uh, we always start out with, with asking forgiveness from, uh, from God because God is the only one um, uh, in our belief that, that can forgive our sins. And Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final and the seal of the prophets of God, and he is not worshipped. So that's really, really important note, is that it doesn't matter who that prophet is in Islam, the worshipping is to Allah, or God alone. So speaking of Muhammad, peace be upon him, as he was the most important, uh, or, uh, you know, one of the most important figures in Islam, obviously, because he's the last prophet. Um, he was born in 570 AD in Mecca, which is in currently in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he was raised by his, uh, his uncle and married a widow um, at 24 years old. His wife was approximately 40. And her name was Khadija. Uh, when he reached 40, um, he took, uh, uh, basically, it was during the month of Ramadan in the lunar calendar, uh, he would take time off each month to go to a, a cave and do meditation. And at one time uh, uh, during his uh, during his his vacation um, in this mountain during his meditation, uh, the angel Gabriel came to him and revealed uh, the first revelations. And it wasn't like this great revelation that came to Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he knew that he was the uh, uh, that he knew he was the chosen prophet to come in there. No, he was actually scared to death. He thought he was having a, uh, a breakdown and he actually ran home, was shivering and everything to his wife, Khadija, and he could not believe what was happening. And his wife, Khadija, knew some, uh, some religious scholars that she put in touch with, Muhammad, peace be upon him, and revealed what was going on. But it's important to note that actually when he was first getting his first revelation before he ran home, the first revelation or the first instruction that, uh, that Gabriel gave uh, uh, to Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, was to recite. And at the time, or uh, actually uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, actually could not read or write. And so this, this voice was telling him to recite. And he's like, I can't read or write. And he says, well, recite. And he's like, I can't read or write. You know, who's telling me this? And then finally, uh, when the angel says it a third time, Muhammad peace be upon him says, okay, what do you, what do you want me to recite? What do you want me to write down? And so, and then it became a miracle that he was able to read and write. Uh, so he began preaching the belief in one God in a polytheistic uh, culture. So at the time, uh, the Arabians uh, would worship uh, Allah, but they would also put statues and goddesses and, and daughters of, uh, of Allah um, uh, next to in, in, in the Kaaba, um, and we'll get into the Kaaba and, 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 and briefly in a little bit. Um, and so uh, at that time, they were not a, uh, they could not be considered an Abrahamic faith uh, at the time the Arabs were, were, were preaching. So 
um, they had gone astray. And that's where the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, again, was, was brought to the people um, as a prophet in order to rectify uh, some of the ills of society. He became the target of an assassination plot and fled to Medina, um, where he became a, a leader of a multi um, a religious area of, of, of Arabia at the time. Um, and uh, he came back in the year 630, returned to Mecca and united the region under one religion. Um, and then in 632, he passes away. So next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, uh, the holy uh, book, which is the Quran. So the Quran is the Islamic holy book composed of the revelations of God through his prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. So Muhammad's first vision, as I said before, was from Gabriel who, who came to him and said, recite. And the Quran is memorized by over 10 million Muslims. It is in the Arabic language, but it has been translated into many, many different uh, languages. And the first Quran that was ever, uh, uh, that was compiled uh, from the, uh, from Muhammad's, uh, um, uh, from the revelations that he received is still there. The original Quran is still intact, unchanged uh, since the um, seventh uh, century. Uh, as I said before, viewed as the unchanged and final uh, authoritative word of God. And it's composed of 114 surahs, uh, or another uh, way of saying it is chapters. So um, interestingly enough, the, the Quran is actually, um, it's not a linear book. Uh, it, it deals with different topics, different stories, um, different issues at the time, and will bring in examples from Moses, peace be upon him, maybe in the first 15 lines of that surah, and then it might switch over to Noah, peace be upon him, and talk about how he dealt with a similar situation. So it's very situational based um, for us to learn. And again, the Quran literally means, uh, it means a guidance for mankind. And that's why it was sent. It was meant sent uh, as the book to help us guide mankind to the right path. Okay, so uh, what are the five pillars of Islam according to uh, the Quran? Um, and these are really important uh, for any Muslim to be a Muslim, they must follow the five pillars of the Quran. So the first pillar is the confession of one's faith in God and that his prophet Muhammad is the final messenger of God. But we also have to believe because Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the final messenger of God, we have to believe in the linear lineage of the prophets from Adam, peace be upon him, all the way to Muhammad, peace be upon him. We have a ritual prayer, which is we do five prayers daily facing Mecca uh, and the Kaaba. Okay, so the Kaaba is the, uh, the center uh, of actually the site uh, in uh, Mecca uh, that was built by Abraham, peace be upon him, and that will, that will come up uh, in the next slide uh, or, or two. Um, and that's important because we, we all do our prayers. Uh, the the uh, Muslim, Muslim community all prays in the same direction um, uh, when, we, when I pray. When I say in the same direction, our community that we are in Simi Valley, we're all going to point, you know, north northwest uh, or north northeast. I'm sorry, north northeast uh, toward uh, Mecca to do our prayers, while someone in Japan would face west to do their prayers um, uh, toward the Kaaba. So uh, the five daily prayers are important for a Muslim because it gives us uh, our our five, at a minimum, it gives us five connections to God every single day. So there is no excuse for us not to remember uh, God. There's no excuse for us not to ask for help. There's no excuse for us to, to not at least have that tether to know, you know, we should be doing the right thing. Uh, another uh, pillar of the um, of Islam is almsgiving, which is charity. So every single year, we have to give each and every Muslim who is capable two and a half percent of our wealth given to the needy each year. So it has to go to the, uh, the people that are in need. Um, and we calculate this out uh, and it's uh, you know, based upon our, our wealth that we have in our bank accounts or, um, or if we have a, a second house, for instance, that we're not living in, um, that would be an excess wealth that we'd have to give our charity um, toward. Uh, so every single year we have to give two and a half percent. And that's regardless of what we give to taxes or anything like that, because our tax money doesn't always go just to um, the needy uh, here, especially here in the United States, it, it goes toward 
you know, infrastructure roads that are also important, but also goes toward things that, that we might not all agree upon, which is weapons and warplanes and, and things like that. So we have to give on top of what we're given taxes, we have to give two and a half percent of our wealth. Fasting. So during the month of Ramadan, um, we're not allowed to have food, drink, or intercourse from dawn to sunset during the month of Ramadan. So again, the month of Ramadan will, will uh, move uh, from year to year. Uh, this year, it's going to be, I think, from April 12th to May 12th. Um, and so we, again, we uh, from dawn to sunset, if you are a uh, a person who is of age, so that's anyone that's, uh, uh, that's hit puberty or older, um, and is able to. So if you're elderly and you have to take medicine, or if you're an adult and you have to take medicine and you, and you're not able to fast, then you are not, uh, you're not obligated to fast. It's only for people that can. Um, so we have no food, no drink that includes water, um, from dawn till sunset. Uh, and then, uh, at sunset, we break our fast. We do more prayers. Um, if it's not a pandemic, we, we would go to the mosque and, uh, and do, uh, some nightly readings of the Quran. Um, and it's a very, very holy month because, again, it's the month where uh, the Quran was, uh, was revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And then finally is the pilgrimage, which is the Hajj uh, uh, to Mecca. And we are supposed to take, uh, if we're able to, um, one trip in our life to Mecca. And, it's, and it can be quite expensive because you got to be there for a couple of weeks. You got to stay in a hotel um and uh, the travel costs to get there so it's it's quite expensive to go so that's why it's uh it's a requirement if you're financially able to do so and the hajj is important because it actually uh, retraces the step of the prophet abraham peace be upon him um and uh what he uh, did uh, many 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 generations ago uh here's an example of a prayer uh when we face mecca so the gentleman doing his prayer here, it's prostration, um, uh, as uh, we believe every prophet uh, from, uh, from Abraham, peace be upon him, to Noah, peace be upon him, to uh, Jesus, peace be upon him, um, to Muhammad, peace be upon him, all prayed this way, it was prostration uh, before God. Um, another important point is the Hajj, uh, and some of the things that we do during the Hajj, and uh, what it is, is uh, it's a unifying focal point of all Muslim prayers. It was built by Abraham and Ishmael, uh, peace be upon him, as a house of monotheistic wor uh, worship. Obviously, it's not the original structure. It's been rebuilt over time. Um, and pilgrims circle it uh, counterclockwise seven times to demonstrate the unity, unity of the believers in the worship of one God. Uh, at the corner of the Kaaba, uh, there's actually a black uh, stone, which actually is a meteorite uh, and believed uh, by many to have been placed at the Kaaba by the prophet Abraham, to be upon him. And again, here's some pictures uh, of uh, Hajj uh, and some time-lapse photos here in the corner. That's why it's, uh, it's blurry of the people going around the, the Kaaba in a counterclockwise uh, fashion. Uh, obviously, this is not during the pandemic um, because uh, this would never, uh, wasn't allowed actually this year, excuse me, the Hajj. Uh, was not allowed uh, to occur from uh, Muslims outside of uh, Saudi Arabia. So only um, uh, the people that lived in Arabia uh, and a very, very, very uh, select uh, number, they controlled the crowds, were allowed to participate um, in Hajj this season. Uh, and one of the really important things is to talk about, you know, Malcolm X's Hajj experience. Um, and if anyone that knows Malcolm X, he really went through uh, trying times in his life. And he evolved as a human being uh, because of his experiences as a young African-American man um, in, you know, pre, uh, uh, you know, I would say pre civil rights era America, there were, there, you know, he was unjustly targeted, had really bad interactions with individuals. And he looked down at, you know, Caucasians and for, 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 uh, for right reasons uh, for how he was treated. But his experiences really changed, or his, his life and his viewpoint really changed on, on the relationship of minorities and African-Americans with other races, such as Caucasians, after his Hajj. And, uh, and I'll read his quote. He says, I've been blessed to visit the holy city of Mecca. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans. But we, we were all participating in the same ritual, 
displaying the same spirit of unity and brotherhood that many experiences in America uh, had led me to believe could never exist between white and the non-white. America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. During the past 11 days here in the Muslim world, I've eaten from the same plates, drank from the same glass, and slept in the same area while praying to the same God with fellow Muslims whose eyes were the bluest of blue, whose hair was the blondest of blonde, and whose skin was the whitest of white. And in the, wor uh, and in the words and in the actions and in the deeds of the white Muslims, I felt the sincerity that I felt among the black African Muslims of Nigeria, Sudan, and Ghana. So this is a wonderful quote from Malcolm X and his experience of what, and what changed in his heart after he experienced Hajj. Because it's not about, as Muslim is not a race, it is a way of life and how in Islam it teaches us a way of life and how we should interact. Islam in the afterlife. So as I stated before, um, switching gears here, uh, no one except God can forgive our sins. So Allah will judge based on our deeds performed, uh, taking into account one's resources. So what this means in terms of one's resources is that if a poor person gives $50 toward charity and they only make $1,000 in their lifetime, that's looked upon greater than the multi-billionaire who gave $1 million uh, to charity in his lifetime. So that's really important to take into account one's resources. On the day of judgment, all will be physically resurrected and judged by God. And there will be a book of deeds that will be read um, and will be weighted your good deeds versus your poor deeds. Uh, devout believers will go directly into paradise with abounding pleasures. And heaven is multi-leveled, meaning that the more pious um, you are in this life, the higher up in heaven you will go. And even the better the experiences heaven will be. I mean, even the lowest levels of heaven would probably be fantastic, but um, that's important to note. The less devout may enter hell and later be brought into heaven at a later time, kind of sort of like purgatory. And then those who reject God, his messengers, and his message will be cast into hell for eternity. So probably similar between uh, um, other Abrahamic religions, especially Christianity um, uh, beliefs uh, when it comes to that. Okay, next topic uh, that can be actually a little bit one where people like put a little question mark, women's rights, because a lot of people when they think of Islam, they're like, oh my God, they put women down. Um, and it's not, you know, it's, it's terrible what they do. And one of the things we wanna make uh, clear is what are the women's rights established um, in Islam? And also uh, note that not all Islamic countries are following Islam, just like not all Christian nations follow, you know, the tenets of Christianity. But if we're talking about the Quran, let's talk about women's rights that, that is codified in Islam. Islam was the first Abrahamic religion to do the following and to codify the following. A woman's right to divorce. A woman in, uh, in pre-Islamic days and some of the other religions were not allowed to initiate divorce. Women's, uh, women have every right to divorce. Uh, a woman's right to receive dowry upon marriage. So dowry is basically the money uh, a man must give in order to uh, maintain a, a, a woman uh, a lifestyle, to take care of her and everything like that. And it's paid up front. It's kind of like the opposite of, of alimony when you get divorced in, um, in our culture. Well, that money is actually given up front uh, as a way to just in case if the marriage doesn't work or whatever, you have money that you're okay. Um, before uh, the dowry was actually reversed and some other cultures are reversed where the woman has to pay for the man. But no, Islam was like, no, the man has to pay the dowry. Restriction of number of wives. And you might be saying, uh, whoa, wait a second. Well, what is that, Ryan? A restriction of the number of wives? Well, if you actually look at the other Abrahamic uh, religions before this, there was zero restrictions on a number of wives a man may have. Islam came in and said, no, you can only have four, but four is the extreme exception. No one that I know of in, uh, in the Islamic community has more than one wife. Um, first of all, we follow the land, uh, the laws of the land here in the United States. But secondly, it's very clear in Islam that you must have, you must treat them equally. You must provide each wife a home to live in. You can't all live in one big 
uh, complex or anything like that and have multiple wives. No, you actually have to provide them a separate home, treat them equally, love them equally. And, you know, let's face it, men really don't do that uh, well to begin with, uh, with, with, with <laughs> sometimes with one wife. So, uh, so basically there are, there are procedures in place to say you have to do these things. And since many of them don't, you know, that's fine. You would see some wealthy men, maybe in Saudi Arabia, have four wives uh, as, uh, you know, as prescribed uh, as the limit, but it is by far the exception. And again, this was prescribed at a time where there was no restriction before that. Uh, so some other uh, women's rights was the right to own land, the right to inheritance, that was important before uh, Islam uh, in, uh, in the uh, areas around the world. Uh, they, women had zero right to inherit money and Islam said, nope, nope, absolutely not. They are supposed to be given their fair share of wealth uh, that they inherit either from the brothers or their father or their husband. Um, they have also the right to keep their, her wealth separate from her husband, okay? So this is really important. Uh, when I married my wife, all the money that she brought before her marriage is hers. All of the uh, money I bring into or that I brought into the marriage is ours. All the money that she makes during our marriage is hers. All the money I make during our marriage is ours. So my wife has, and any wife in Islam, has the fundamental right to keep her wealth completely separate. It is the man's responsibility in Islam to provide for his family. Now, there's nothing to, uh, to say that a wife uh, uh, can't mix her funds with her, uh, with her husband if she wants to, but she has absolutely the right to keep her wealth completely separate and does not have to, is not obligated within the religion to pay for maintenance fees of, you know, to pay for the house or to pay for uh, uh, the house to be cleaned or to buy a car or anything like that. It is the man's responsibility. And finally, the right to testify in court um, was granted uh, as well. Okay, but you might say, what about the hijab? Okay, so the Quran instructs both Muslim men and women to dress in a modest way. The clearest verse on the requirement of the modest dress is Surah 24, um, which is chapter 24, verse 31, telling women to guard their beauty. And it said, and say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their private parts, that they should not display their beauty and ornaments except uh, what most ordinarily appear thereof, that they should draw their clothing over their breasts and not display their beauty except to close relatives. And I would ask you, what is Mary wearing in this picture? Oh, she's wearing a hijab. So um, the hijab is not meant as anything to subjugate women, to put them down. It is, uh, a hijab is uh, also, again, the covering over their head is, uh, strictly a woman's choice of uh, if she wants to cover her head in that way. Um, but regardless, men and women are supposed to uh, not show off uh, their body parts. For instance, I'm a man, as a Muslim man, I cannot go to the beach in a Speedo. And I don't think anyone would want to see that regardless, but that would be a violation um, also uh, as well um, of, of guarding, uh, lowering my gaze and guarding uh, uh, my body. So that's important. Okay, next topic, Sharia law. Okay, this is another controversial one. You might say, oh my God, Sharia law. People really in the news love to talk about Sharia law and, and what it means. So what does Sharia law mean? It means God's law. And it's an interpretation of rights, laws, and punishments as, described, uh, as prescribed in the Quran. So that means food allowed by Muslims, that's you know, no pork. Um, establishment of holidays, elimination of gambling, which applies only to Muslims. If you are Christian uh, or, uh, uh, or Jewish, you can, you can gamble. Adultery. Um, in order to be convicted of adultery, you need to have four witnesses to convict. Well, I don't know many people that uh, commit adultery with four people uh, lying around. So, um, so that's part of Sharia law. Other crimes, you know, we have laws on stealing, embezzlement, lying, you know, things on taxes. And it's also important to note that, that each Muslim country can be different. I mean, and just because Saudi Arabia does something, again, Saudi Arabia, part of, uh, uh, part of the population, again, where only 20% of Muslims are Arab, Saudi Arabia doesn't represent Islam. A lot of people want to say that they do, but they don't. There is nothing in Sharia law that says a woman can drive a car. 
my wife's home country of Pakistan. Women can be fighter pilots. They can be top gun fighter, fighter, fighter pilots in Pakistan, but in Saudi Arabia, they, were, they, they weren't allowed to drive. So that's completely different. Just like Islam, Islamic countries can have different views on their laws, just as the laws of Christian nations of France, Canada, and the United States can be quite different. I'm sure that France and Canada look at the way we do healthcare and are horrified, but we're all, we're all Muslim or we're all Christian, that we're all Christian nations. So it's not one size fits all. Uh, another important topic is Jesus in Islam. And after Moses, Jesus is the most mentioned prophet in Islam. So Muhammad is actually only mentioned four times. And one of my favorite quotes in, uh, in the Quran is the one talking about uh, Jesus, peace be upon him's birth. And it says, remember when the angel said, oh, Mary, God gives you good news of a word from him, whose name is the Messiah, Jesus, son of Mary, revered in this world and in the hereafter. And one of those brought near to me, to God. He will speak to the people from the cradle. And as a man, he is of the righteous. And then Mary said, my Lord, how can I have a child when no mortal has touched me? He said, so it will be. God creates what he wills. If he decrees a, if he decrees a thing, he says to it only be, and it is. Sounds very familiar, huh? <laughs> So we have a lot in common. Um, so Jesus, uh, uh, peace be upon him, in Islam, Mary um, uh, is actually given her own chapter in the Quran, chapter 19. Um, and it talks uh, in, in different, again, verses. It might jump around a little bit. But um, there is a really, really great uh, chapter. And hopefully I uh, have a little bit of time at the end because uh, I know we're running out of time. I'd love to talk about uh, Mary's parents and and their prayer about uh, uh, having a righteous child and their shock uh, when they when they had a girl. So um, that's a that's a great story as well. But um, in the interest of time, I'll keep moving on. Um, Jesus in Islam. Uh, so a little bit more about this. He performed many miracles, but it's stated explicitly in the Quran that his powers were bestowed on him by God. That was the speaking of the cradle giving sight to the blind, healing the lepers, raising the dead, breathing life into clay birds, um, being able to feed, uh, 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 just uh, uh, doing the large table spread coming from heaven. All of that is in the Quran, uh, but it's, it's, it's miracles that, uh, that Jesus could only perform uh, when God uh, granted him those powers. The Quran, uh, the Quran states that God raised Jesus straight into heaven and that God made his enemies believe they had crucified him, um, and that uh, Jesus will return to earth prior to the day of judgment to restore justice and defeat slay the El Messiah uh, Dajjal, which uh, means the false Messiah, or also known as the Antichrist. So very similar in Christianity, um, we believe that Jesus, peace be upon him, will actually come back toward the day of judgment and actually uh, fight and slay um, the, uh, the false messiah, the, the antichrist. So very similar to Christianity. Okay, jihad, uh, controversial topic. A lot of people are like, oh my God, jihad, when they hear that. It's like, you know, I, I swear people like really freak out when they hear about this. And, you know, obviously when, when, you, when you hear um, people do things in, uh, in the name of Islam, which are quite wrong. Uh, you know, a lot of you, like, you hear what G, you hear jihad. So what does jihad mean? It literally means struggle in the path of God. So jihad is donating your time one weekend uh, uh, at a food kitchen instead of sleeping on the couch. Jihad is parting from your wealth to feed the poor. Jihad is a struggle against one's evil in uh, inclinations, not to drink, not to gamble. But what about war? So war is mentioned in the Quran, but war is only allowed in defense or in support of those oppressed. Only two instances where war is allowed. And we have quite a bit of commands from the prophet uh, uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, on war such as don't cut a tree down, don't kill a woman, don't kill a child, don't kill a sick person, don't target old people and kill them, don't kill a monk or priest or any man of God, don't destroy a temple or a church, don't disfigure the dead, don't destroy a building, don't kill an animal except for eating, don't kill those who surrendered, don't kill those who run away, don't enforce Islam, and 
a really, really, I saved the, this last one, be good to prisoners and feed them. And there's a story. There was a story of when the early days of Islam and there was a battle. And uh, the Islamic community at that time had very, very few resources and they didn't have enough, they had barely had enough food and they had some prisoners with them. And the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had commanded about the, the, one of the worst things you could do before God Almighty is to let your prisoners be treated poorly and not feed them. So they were so fearful of disobeying God that they gave their rations and they fed their prisoners and they went hungry themselves because it would have been such a grievous sin not to, not to feed their prisoners. So that's one of my favorite stories about, uh, about you know, how things should go um, and how things did go in the past. Uh, and the last topic I wanna cover tonight before we get to questions and answers, because I know we got uh, a few questions that have rolled in. Um, what are the jinn? So, uh, and you might say, well, jinn, what is that? Is that genie? Uh, well, kind of, uh, but it's actually a, uh, a, a misnomer coming from, you see things in Disney and, and things like that. That's not how it works. But uh, so unlike Christianity, um, Islam does not believe that Iblis, which is the Arabic uh, term for Lucifer, was a fallen angel. So uh, what, uh, so what, what, what was Iblis? Uh, so Iblis is a jinn and jinn are beings that were created by God from smokeless fire. So this is before humans, uh, were, were created. Um, and jinn are still around today and they have free will. Angels are made of light. They have no free will and humans, uh, are made from clay and have free will. So, um, uh, I, I will, I want to re relate to the story of how Iblis, uh, uh, fell from God's good uh, graces and was shunned from heaven. Um, uh, and so how the story goes is that um, uh, the jinn, in, uh, so Iblis is, is, is the leader of all the jinn and he was the greatest of all the jinn and he was allowed to be in heaven along with the angels. And um, God created uh, uh, man from clay and after he created him, he taught uh, man um, uh, all the names of all the birds and animals and everything and plants. And, uh, and then he asked, the, uh, uh, he asked um, Adam, you know, what was the name of, you know, this animal? And Adam replied what it was. Um, and then he asked the angels, you know, what's the name of this animal? And the angels were like, hey, we don't know. You know, you, we only know what you tell us and you never told us. And so, and, and uh, God's like, absolutely. I just want to show the knowledge that I passed on to mankind and, and how great of a creation um, he is. And I ask you to all bow before Adam. So all the angels bowed and Iblis did not. Iblis is like, wait a second here. Are you kidding me? He's made from clay. I'm made from smokeless fire. That's way cooler. And we can agree. That's pretty cool. But Iblis disobeyed God and God was not happy. But before God completely uh, threw him out of, of heaven and then eventually out of the Garden of Eden as well, is that he, uh, Iblis asked for two wishes and God granted them both. He asked that his punishment be delayed until the day of judgment. And he asked, and unfortunately for humans, uh, he asked to say, let me whisper in the ears of man until then to take them away from the righteous path. And God said, so be it. So maybe not the best thing for man, but God wills what he wills. So Iblis' name changed to Shaitan when he was banished from heaven. Um, and then uh, also the story goes of him uh, uh, offering the, uh, the apple to Adam and Eve. The different story between Christianity and Islam is that in, uh, in Christianity, it was knowledge. Um, in Islam, it is immortality that was offered. Uh, so that's important to note. Uh, and you, you maybe even see this replicated of what you saw in the dark ages uh, in Europe of scientists and people that said, you know, the planets revolve around uh, the sun uh, and not around the earth. And they're like, you heretic, you must be killed at the stake, you know? And so you see a lot of that stuff because knowledge would seem bad where it's not, it's, we don't want that perception to be out there. It's knowledge is not a bad thing. It's uh, in that, in Islam the story is again, slightly different uh, meaning immortality. 
Um, and then finally, the jinn also roam the earth and we cannot see them, um, but they can also choose to follow God or follow shaitan. So they have free will as well and they get uh, judged on the day of judgment. So um, I think we've got about 15 minutes or so and I think we got uh, um, uh, a few questions here and I'm going to uh, kind of answer them uh, 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 one by one here. So the first one is from Barbara and uh, why do you say that you reverted uh, rather than converted from Christianity uh, to Islam, especially since Islam came after Christianity? Uh, great question, Barbara. Uh, so uh, 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 I use the term reverted because again, um, in, our, in our religion, um, even though we say Muhammad peace be upon him uh, is the prophet that brought uh, Islam uh, to the masses, we believe that Islam started from day one from Abraham peace be upon him. And it's been the same religion since day one. So, uh, so that's the reason why uh, when I say reverted, because again, in, um, in the Islamic point of view, we believe that Adam, peace be upon him, was Muslim. We believe that Moses, peace be upon him, was Muslim. We believe Noah, Jesus, peace be upon him, they were all Muslim. So, and, and, and again, Muslim means uh, uh, submission. So, uh, the submission to one God. And so when you think of Islam meaning that or and, and uh, submission to one God in Muslim, one who submits, that's why we believe that the, all the previous prophets were, were Muslim. So that's why I use that term, uh, revert. Okay, uh, you mentioned five prayers a day, same time each day, what time? Yes, it's based, a uh, great question here. Uh, it does uh, rotate uh, a little bit, uh, but it has to do with the positioning of the sun um, so during the winter time, the prayers will kind of be condensed a little bit more and during the summertime, they'll be longer. So we have a prayer at dawn called Fudger prayer. Uh, we have a prayer at high noon or right around high noon, which is where the sun's at the highest point, uh, called, uh, Zohar. Our third prayer, Usr, is, uh, mid afternoon where your shadow is about the length of your body. Um, and then we have another one at sunset called Maghrib and another one after the, after it gets completely dark, which is about an hour and 15 minutes after Maghrib, um, called, uh, Isha prayer. So we have prescribed times and we have windows to get each prayer done. So great question. Um, how long does uh, Hajj last? Is there a significance to going around seven times and counterclockwise? Uh, great question. I'll actually actually like to get back to you, Barbara, on the significance of the seven times and going counterclockwise, because I actually haven't done Hajj. So hopefully I will be able to do that sometime and, uh, and go and do that. So Hajj uh, occurs um, uh, about two months after uh, Ramadan. Um, and I think if I'm not mistaken, again, I have to look it up a little bit. I think it lasts uh, a week, uh, maybe 10 days or so. Um, so I'll, I'll have to see how long it, uh, it, uh, it goes and get back to you, Barbara. That's a, that's a great question. Uh, probably the, my, my weakest of the five pillars, because again, I haven't personally done it and I would, I love, would love to do it some, uh, some point and, uh, and learn a lot more, but uh, great question. Okay. Um, another one from Barbara, does your soul continue to progress through the levels of heaven after death? Uh, from my understanding, no. Uh, so you will get assigned to a level of heaven based upon your deeds uh, uh, of, uh, of what you did during your life. There's nothing you can do after your life that will, will, will change, uh, uh, to change what you've done. So, uh, so there is nothing, uh, uh, you know, once, if you, if you're the bottom level of heaven or the top level of heaven, I think that's a sign to you on, on the day of judgment. Uh, but I do believe if I'm not mistaken, that, uh, from my understanding is that there might be some progression, I think to visit, um, loved ones who might be on a different level of heaven, or you can invite them if I'm not mistaken, Barbara. Uh, but that again, is not to stay, uh, forever and ever at the, at the same level. And, and heaven is, it's impossible to, to, to describe. I mean, it's so far and ab above and beyond anything we have on earth to even describe, uh, what it is or what it, uh, uh, or what it's going to be like, but that's a great question. Um, uh, another one uh, from Barbara. Barbara, you're on top of it with your questions. I love it. Is dowry given to the woman or to her father? Absolutely not given to her father. No, dowry is given to the woman. It's her money um, and uh, has nothing to do with her father. Uh, and that's what they call, um, uh, you know, what people might say, oh, this is arranged marriage, right? So 
you got to understand the Muslim dating scene here. Muslim dating scene is exactly 100% like Match.com, except for the parents are the computer. So they're the ones trying to, uh, you know, match their daughter or their, uh, or their son up with someone they talk to people. And, and, and people can meet on their own. It's, it's not a problem. So when they talk about arranged marriages, it's not like arranged like the, the woman has never met the man before. No, absolutely not. It's just the family is kind of involved in the process, um, but, but absolutely not. The dowry is only given to the woman, not to her father. Her father has nothing to do with the money. Um, next question, Barbara. So Muslims believe there'll be no more prophets after Muhammad, peace be upon him. Yes, that is true. So Muhammad is the seal of the prophets. So uh, the question is then when uh, Jesus comes back, is, is he a prophet? So no, when actually Jesus comes back, he is not considered a prophet anymore. He's considered just a man, um, but he was, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I might miss, misspoke there, but uh, because uh, Jesus was already a prophet, beforehand, Muhammad still considered the last of the prophets. Jesus will just uh, live out uh, the remainder of his life um, and then continue doing his, uh, his uh, uh, you know, I think it's like 40 years of his life. Um, but he will, his, his main role will be to be the guidance uh, of mankind uh, to get to, uh, toward the day of judgment and to kill um, the, um, the false prophet. But he's not going to uh, from my understanding, it's not going to be the same thing of the uh, of the same mission that he was on uh, during the first 30 years of his life. Uh, but that, but there's no more prophets. No one can come in in Islam and claim to be a prophet. Uh, no one can do that. Um, okay. Uh, can we give a question on having a concubine? So yes. Uh, so yeah. So that that question comes up sometimes about uh, uh, people about what your uh, in, in Islam, remember they uh, they they restrict it to four having four wives. Some of the people in wealthy get around that by saying, uh, "What about uh, concubines?" Because it's also mentioned uh, in there about what your right hand possesses. So what that really had to do with basically was, unfortunately, slavery was slavery was a uh, was something that uh, is an it was an issue during the time of Islam. And Islam could not, at the time, eradicate uh, slavery, just like Christianity, just like Judaism uh, could not eradicate it uh, as well. Um, but Islam came in and put a lot of restrictions on it. So in Islam, if someone accepts Islam, if a slave accepts Islam, their children are born free. So very different than what happened here in the United States with slavery. I mean, you could pump out, African-Americans could have as many children as they want. They could be believers in Christianity, but they're still going to work in the fields, unfortunately, as a slave. Islam, that was completely uh, unallowed. Islam hated slavery, but, they, but it knew that it could not change people drastically that drastic. So it had to put, uh, 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 had to put roadblocks in place to kind of weed it out. So but going back to the question of concubines and that was, was what your right hand possessed. And was basically what slaves you possessed who also were, you know, quote unquote, uh, uh, your mistresses on the side. Um, so that's where it comes from, but it's really not meant to be that you can have mistresses on the side. No, absolutely not. That's, that's adultery. Um, and uh, anyone that's doing that post slavery being completely eradicated, that's not, something that uh, is part of mainstream Islam or that anyone recognizes. So that's a great question. Uh, what is the two uh, difference, uh, differences between the two branches of Islam? Great question. So Shia and Sunni, I didn't really talk about this um, because I really think it's more political uh, than anything else. So um, Sunni is about 85% of Islam and Shia is about 15%. I would say it's probably analogous to being uh, Protestant and Catholic. Uh, uh, and really the, uh, the, the branch started off pretty early in Islam and had to do with the succession of leadership after the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, passed away. Um, and so, uh, so that's the, uh, the difference between, um, uh, a, a little bit above, about that, but again, Shia, I think puts a lot more emphasis on, uh, the, uh, of imams and gives them a lot more powers than Sunnis do. 
Um, but in regardless, it's still, it's still, you know, mainstream Islam and everything like that. So it's just, it's more political and regional based more than anything. Um, next question is, I know this is an oversimplification, but I would characterize the goal of Christianity as next world focused, improving your relationship with God, Jesus, and heaven forever. The main purpose of Judaism is focusing on improving the world in this faith. How would you characterize the, uh, the principal purpose of Islam? Um, great question. Uh, I think the main goal for all our uh, religions, obviously, is to get to the uh, afterlife. Um, but yeah, it's really focused on also improving our lives because the Quran is the guidance of mankind. Uh, it tells us how we should behave. It tells us uh, that we shouldn't cheat. We shouldn't steal. We shouldn't do all these things. It, it, it helps provide a, a rule, a set of rules that we could all abide by and give us a better world uh, to get us into the afterlife. And, but, but Islam makes it quite clear uh, Michael, uh, it makes it quite clear that this, this world is very, very temporary. Um, and in fact, uh, on the day of judgment, when you're woken up, you believe you only lived for a half a day or part of a day. You didn't realize you lived years. So the afterlife is really much, 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 much more. And that this world is actually a test. It's a, it's a, it's a big test for us to determine. Um, uh, it, it's a big test for us to determine how, how we're going to, if we're going to make it to the next world, if we're going to go to heaven, if we're going to go to hell. And so, um, but in that test, we all have to do our best, our best job. And so, um, and so I would say it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both between, um, between what you described um, there. Um, but it's, you, you got to follow it. And there's a lot of people who, who claim to be um, Muslim and, and don't follow it. Um, and, uh, and I mean, we see this all the time. I mean, we see this with, uh, with, uh, with terrorism. I mean, um, you know, the, you equate Islam with uh, uh, a lot of people with like Islamic terrorism and everything like that. And, and it's terrible and it's, and it's portrayed in the media that way. And, and, but a vast majority of people killed in terrorist attacks are actually Muslims where mosques are bombed and everything like that. And, and we, we ignore, you know, we attach religion to, toward that on the Islamic side, but we don't attach it to some of the other things that happen, whether it's ethnic cleansing and genocide that's happening in Burma. That's, that's done by Buddhists against Muslims with the Rohingya Muslims are being raped and butchered to death. Uh, the Chinese Uyghur Muslims are in concentration camps. Um, you know, we see the capital attack happen. Um, you know, those, India. yeah, we see concentration camps in India. We see shootings at schools. You know, these things, these bad things are happening, but they're not, they're not Muslim related. These are, these are other religions, but unfortunately no one tags the other religions like that, like they do with Islam, unfortunately. But, um, but yeah, that was, I was a little bit off topic, but I just wanted to point that out. Uh, when it comes full circle about, you know, the principal purpose of Islam and, and everything like that. Um, next question is about jewelry. Uh, is jewelry allowed to be worn? Yes, jewelry is allowed to be worn. Um, you're allowed to uh, do jewelry. Um, you're allowed to do, um, you know, henna, um, which is the temporary tattoos. You can't do um, uh, full on tattoos that are permanent. That's not allowed um, in uh, Islam, but jewelry is absolutely allowed. Um, how do you see Islam being shaped in the future? Uh, great question, Tony. I think we're going through a little bit of a Middle Ages ourselves. I think that there are things that the Islamic world needs to do a better job of. I think, um, I think that people need to understand the Quran. I think that people who don't speak Arabic need to understand the Quran. Right now, there's too many people preaching um, Arabic only, and they're treating the Quran like a... Harry Potter spell that basically if I say something enough in Arabic, it's going to make things better. No, they need to understand it in their own language. And that needs to happen. And unfortunately, it's not. So I think that needs to change in the Islamic world going forward. Um, and I think it is. I think it is start, uh, starting to change. Uh, we talked about the different denominations in Islam, about the Shia and Sunni. Okay, terrorism forbidden. Why does it happen more in Islam compared to other faiths? I think I just answered that a little bit before, which is... Um, uh, uh, which is basically, uh, I think it's a media perception. Um, it's a little bit about the, uh, uh, about how it's, you know, I'd say how it's described in the media is again, um, unfortunately, Muslims, we bear the brunt of every, of all the, the 2.8 billion Muslims in the world, um, or however many it was, I think I quoted at the beginning or 1.8 billion. 
Um, every single one of any one of them does something wrong. The Muslim world, we have to answer for it, but you don't see that in other religions. You don't, you don't feel that in Christianity, you need to answer for the people carrying the crosses uh, and, and attacking the Capitol building. I don't feel like as a Christian, I ever had to respond to that. And I think unfortunately you do as a Muslim, uh, uh, fair or unfair. Uh, is it a requirement to uh, repeat peace be upon him after the mention of each prophet? Uh, requirement, I, I think it's a sign of, uh, of respect more than anything. Um, so uh, so th that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's more of a sign of respect. Uh, is the day of judgment immediately after you die or sometime in the distant future? No, great question. No, it's way out in the distant future. The day of judgment is for everyone. So uh, it, uh, it won't occur. Um, it's not like you die, you get judged right away and you're gonna go to heaven or hell. No, uh, everyone gets uh, judged on the, uh, the day of judgment. It's a long process. It's an arduous process. Uh, we all get um, uh, risen from our graves. We have to answer for what we've done. Um, hopefully Wendy can have that talk uh, sometime in the future where we talk about life after death because there's some great topics on, on that with, with Islam. Um, with what happens within your grave, uh, you, you have two angels that uh, ask you about the good things you've done and the bad things you've done. You've done. And in fact, you have two angels on your shoulder uh, every day of your life. And they record, uh, the angel on your right records all the good deeds you've done. The angel on the left records all the bad deeds you do. And it's written in, in Allah's uh, book. Um, and so, uh, and then the other important thing is that, um, I know we're a little bit over time, so, uh, but hopefully you guys will forgive me for going a little bit over. Um, but one of the uh, uh, really important things is that Islam uh, uh, constantly, uh, Islam has a lot of, I would say, vivid imagery of the afterlife, whether it's heaven, but especially of hell. And so it's, it's a little bit scary when you read some of the passages about hell, and, it, and it's meant to, to be there. And it talks about, you know, we talked about the five pillars, we talked about giving charity, and it talks about you take nothing with you into the afterlife except for two things. One is you, you get judged on your deeds. The thing is wealth. There is a description in the Quran that's quite vivid. And it talks about the wealthy people who go to hell because they did not give uh, their two and a half percent to, uh, to charity. They didn't give to charity. And they go to hell. Um, it's quite vivid in the Quran. They take their wealth with them. They take their gold with them. And the heat of hell burns the gold that's on their bodies and it stays on them uh, for eternity within hell. So it's quite vivid. <laughs> so uh, so it's, it's really, really uh, out there. So that's why a lot of Muslims, we, we take, you know, Allah and everything very seriously with, with, our, uh, with our prayers and with, with giving to our, the five pillars and everything like that. If you ever miss one of your five uh, time prayers, can you make it up later? Or absolutely, you have to stop everything and do it. Uh, no, you can make it up uh, later. And in fact, um, uh, in fact, uh, there are different uh, uh, prescriptions out there. Uh, uh, you know, if you're if you're sick, for instance, and you can't do your uh, prayer, you can just you know, let's like, say you're paralyzed. Um, you could just blink, uh, and that counts as doing your prayers uh, uh, that way. Um, but, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're traveling, you can do your prayers shortened, um, and you can make it up at a later date. So you can absolutely make up your, your prayers. Uh, but if you have the ability to do your prayers at home, um, or if you're at the office and you could shut an office door or go someplace private, you're expected to do your prayers on time, but, uh, but God knows uh, what's in our hearts and what we have to do for, uh, to do our prayers. And so, but if we don't have a legitimate excuse for making, uh, for missing a prayer, then it's obviously a sin. But if we have a legitimate excuse, um, then, you yeah, know, we make it up at a later date. Um, okay, uh, this is a great question. Uh, is, uh, in some Abrahamic faiths, it is said that God created humans in his image. What is Islam's take? Great question. So, uh, no, Islam does not have this uh, uh, in Islam. It, uh, God did not create us in his image. Um, in Islam, uh, uh, we are uh, closer to we are closer to a microbe than we are to uh, to God in terms of the majestic of of, of Allah. Um, we're closer to an ant. We're closer to you know anything like that. So uh, we don't believe God created us in His image. Uh, Allah is is unfathomably known uh, of what He looks like or or anything like that. So He's not some 
you know, old white guy with a beard uh, as portrayed in the movies. Uh, we can't even fathom what he looks like. And, and this is also important too. You know, I come from a microbiology background and everything like that. And this goes to, you know, what, you know, the mission that we have to Mars and what, what if we find life on other planets? What if another race of aliens, you know, here's one of our signals in the future, or we hear them. Well, what does that mean? Um, and so uh, one of the things uh, that I go back to is um, the Quran and it says, indeed, we have dignified the children of Adam, carried them on land and sea, granted them good and lawful provisions and privileged them from above many of our creations. And if you listen to one of my last words, uh, or not my last words, it's God's last words of that verse. He says many, he doesn't say all, he says many. So it goes to believe that, you know, mankind was, was put on this planet uh, as, uh, as a vice generate uh, of planet earth, which is basically to take care uh, of planet earth. Um, one could argue we've done a really bad job of that. Um, um, but that's what we're put on. We, we are a very special, uh, uh, you know, group uh, uh, creation of God. But the Quran tells us in this verse, if you interpret it the way I've interpreted it, and many other peoples have interpreted it, we're not, we're not necessarily number one. You know, and so we can't just come in there and, you know, if we, you know, we are able to find life on another planet or intelligent life somewhere, we're not going to come in and say, hey, buddy, you're screwed, man. God looks like us. No, Islam doesn't have that take. So um, that's, a, that's a great one. Um, but yeah, so I think we, we answered all the questions. I know we went a few minutes over, but I want to thank you guys again for, for all your wonderful questions, for staying with us uh, for, for the hour. And, uh, and, uh, and also we, we want to say, uh, we look forward to hearing from you in, in March, uh, to come to the, uh, to the, the topic on the Shumash, um, native, uh, tribe that's coming at Shumash traditions, March 25th at 7 PM. That's going to be really fascinating. Um, I, I'm one person who doesn't, uh, know uh, anything about the Shumash tradition. So it'd be really, really great to hear what, um, uh, what our native uh, brothers and sisters um, who lived here long before we were, um, uh, how they worshiped uh, God. So, you know, please uh, come March 25th, uh, check it out, 7 p.m., same time as before. And again, thank you guys so very much for your, uh, for your time tonight. And I really appreciate your questions and, and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you guys. I'll be here uh, to answer any questions if anyone wants to type any afterwards for a few more minutes before we drop off.